Good everyone, and thank you for joining Hosokawa's webinar on how powder flow properties can impact product quality. My name is Boyer, and I'm the meeting manager for Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems. We find today's presentation informative and enjoyable. If you have questions, please feel free to submit them throughout the presentation using the question panel. We answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Powder Systems was founded in 1923 under the name Pulverizing Machinery. We design and manufacture equipment for sedge reduction, classification, mixing, containment, compaction, and laboratory analysis. Research and testing facilities complete with an analytical laboratory and I'm at New Jersey office. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Tim Calvo, from our analytical equipment department. He's been a member of the Hosokawa team for more than 25 years. Welcome, everyone. We're off by giving you a brief idea as to what we're going to be discussing during today's webinar. Uh, first of all, history and the various applications. Why are we here today? Well, quite frankly, we're here to be able to provide you with an alternative as to how to determine how water flow can improve your end Productivity. What we're going to specifically be talking about will be the Pulse Micron Powder Characteristics Tester, MOPTX. Back in the 60s, Rail Carr Jr. developed a set of standards, otherwise known as the Carr Indices, to determine the flow properties of solids. PX complies all of those standards, as well as the fact that since the development of, of modern-day technology, as far as the methods, um, there has been an ASTM standard developed for the particular method. These determine the flowability and floodability of dry powders. Now, performing any of the flow characterization important to understand your, your sample. So some primary uh, pieces of information that you'll need before various methods. First, most importantly, is particle size analysis. You need to know what your product is, whether it's a blend or a single product, a single powder method, a sample, uh, before starting. It's material moisture. Now, if you notice the material moisture here, we have coffee, which is clearly evident in the dry mode. However, when it's permitted to uh, come in contact with the atmosphere or the environment, it'll absorb moisture out of the air, alias the hygroscopicity of the material. Now, when the powder is or the coffee is dry, it will have fairly good flow characterization. However, when it becomes saturated, the flow becomes uh, very this is extremely common. The analytical environment is different than that of the process environment. So good to know what the environment is as to when you're conducting the analysis of the product in comparison to that of where the product's going to be used. Powder flowability. In beef, powderability is the stinary state. This is called flowability. Determine the free flowing particles, independence, and the, the ease in which to transport the powder from one location to another. Uh, properties or attributes of those powders or samples will affect this. As you can see, as we talked about earlier, the particle size. A very fine particle, you have a greater surface area, and which gives the higher potential for cohesion, and that will affect how free-flowing the powder is. Shape is another 
aggressivity is another. Um, again, the untable would like process. So, so what well can be impressed on the powder sample to, to react differently? As we did a little bit earlier, the high viscosity or the moisture content will have a direct impact on how the powder is going to flow. Now, at this juncture, I'd just like to mention, each every one of you attendees have different requirements, different needs, different aspects of your samples. There is no specific formula that you identify from one product to the next to the next that will standardize how well your powder flows. So each sample can have and do have different characteristics. Okay, flowable powder, the uh, attributes. Once we smaller surface area, now we look at the larger surface area or the larger particle size. The material has a tendency not to agglomerate or cohesion. Your dense low, which is kind of common with the particle size and viscosity. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about the various methods that Ralph developed that can identify the, the, the specific attributes of those samples. Floating, take into consideration, those listed on the left, basic angle repose, density measurements, compressibility, spatula, cohesion and or uniformity, in or the other. One and identified those attributes. At that point, you take an overall flowability, and that to the angle of difference and dispersibility to determine the flowability. Now, a bit about the actual methods themselves. And propose, as we all know, is the of a heap of material or sample over a defined platform that gives you an angle. The milling against itself, as it flows against itself, it will build either a very, very high peak, medium peak, or in this case here, it's quite regular, I mean, it's, it's equalized, and, or a low peak. What's nice to know is the fact that the lower the angle of repose, the greater the flowability. Taking that original heap of material, or sav here, that we determine the angle of repose, and we impact it, or shock it. We have three defined identical force impacts, or g-forces, that disturbs the heap for the particles to flow against themselves. Thus, changing the heat, as you see here in the caption to the left. So here, if the angle of fall is low, your flowability and floodability will be high. And without these different features and attributes and how they can affect the, uh, the use and how you need to handle the product. This particular screenshot shows is the angle of difference. What's about this is it gives you a clear picture as to the angle of repose versus the angle of fall. And it's clearly defined just by merely shocking that particular platform three times, you change how that powder heat is. So, in there, the angle of difference is if it's high. In case it would be, it has a greater flowability aspect. Along with the the measurements, near area bulk density. What characteristics tester uses is a defined container to determine the actual uh, aerated density. What we'll do is we'll aerate the density first. So take a sampler and we slowly or control fill the cup. We're using 100 cc cup, right? 
graduated cylinder where it's an optical measurement, CC cup, is, it will never change, and there is no need for anyone to interpret uh, the level of the sample based upon the hash marks on a graduated cylinder. See here, like the angle of repose, you tend to overfill the cup, and then the cup is scraped so that we have a defined volume of material. Now, the standard, and we typically use 100 cc or alias 100 ml, there can be options for a 50, 25, or 10 cc. Why would people do that? Simply because the value of the product is extremely high, or they just have a limited amount of product. And notice there that there's a USP graduated cylinder. We um, all that for clients who must replicate a specific measurement. Packaging. With the capacity, what we're going to do now is basically put an extension on the 100cc cup, which is quite frankly the same capacity as the cup itself. When you fill that, retain. And what we're going to do is we're going to tap, tap the, in accord with the car measurement for 180 taps at a, measure, a drop height of 18 millimeter. That will the 180 taps have concluded at which time if the material is, which it should be, above the lip of the cup is shaped and made. This tends to be a more reliable form of measurement when determining the pack bulk density. Complete. Now the aerated measurement and the pack measurement, we can determine the percentage of compressibility. How much more material did we fill in that 100 cc cup? We take and divide the aerated by the pack to identify the compressibility. Again, dealing with a fixed volume of material, and that fixed volume of material can change. However, in this here, as a quick rule of thumb, the lower the compressibility, the high flowability. Another angle of spatula is considered or called internal friction. However, pan of material that has been placed in the bottom of the pan, the spatula, by means of lowering the pan, is elevated out of the heap of material. Look at the end view of the heap to determine its measurement. That is, we measure the front, ship once or impact it once, its configuration, and then the average of the two, which is considered the angle of spatula. So the potential here being a low angle of spatula is going to increase or have high flowability value. Yeah. Here that gives you a uh, pictorial view of how it would look in real life. So this is the first angle. This is the second angle. We do the two which becomes the angle of spatula. As in the first chart there, under the flowability, it's either cohesion or uniformity. There are parameters that must be met to decide which measurement is going to be used. However, please take note that we're working or we're identifying that parameter by means of the Now, we're going to talk about cohesion, and I skipped over that simply because we're going to revisit it a little bit further here. So once we've established what the mean bulk density of the product is, and this here, we're looking at less than 0.4 grams per cc, uh, what we're going to identify now is how the various sieve screens. We'll find sample of material we're analyzing. We're going to place it on top of the three screens that have been tear weighted and that 
with an amplitude of one millimeter. It's radical vibration, which radical vibrations could, for all practical intents and purposes, cause for degradation of the material. What one is a natural deterioration of the cohesion of the product. So one measure what's retained on each of these to identify what the cohesion percentage is. In the event it has high cohesion, it has poor flowability, which is pretty logical when you think about it. Okay, some of the parameters in order to perform the various tests, in this case, here's the cohesion test. No greens highlighted sections. So if we're getting less than 0. 0.4 grams per cc, 100% of the material must be finer than 150 microns. So back to the slide that we looked at before, and as I mentioned here, the material must pass through the various screens. It must be less than 150 micron. Now, science, you know, my material was micron, okay, um, but very low density. It may have a low density, but it may have a high coating factor. And it can be determined using this particular method and identify what the cohesion is. So if it coats the, the wires of the screens, they can all be picked up. To so the accuracy of the balance that goes along with that, so you can get down to those fine levels, is points. All right. Again, between 1.9. Greater than nine. Logically, when you're thinking about it, your mean bulk density, the higher you get, the larger the particles you get. They must be less than 50, 75, or 55 micron in order to perform the cohesion test. You well, meet the criteria for cohesion. In an index value, you must perform the uniformity test. And as you see here, while this is somewhat exaggerated, but particle shape comes into play here. If you have a uniform particle shape, you're going to be able to identify that with this particular measurement. We talked about having particle size distribution or knowing the particle size distribution of your product. That assist you in the cohesion test, but most importantly, it'll assist you here in the uniformity test. You should identify at that same time as at the 60% value and the micron size at the 10% value. These values were determined when Rust methods back in the mid 60s and by many, over 3,000 different materials. So let's look at the uniformity here. The greater the uniformity, the ability because now the surface area is equal throughout. As we're density or using that as our quote unquote trigger point to determine which test is going to be used. Fifty micron, but less than point four grams per cc. Well if then we do the uniformity test because you've got D ten and the D sixty that, that information is into the equation, and you're identifying now the overall car. Dispersibility. Disability takes place when we take a material, drop onto a, a pre prepared watch glass, as you see here in the caption to the left, identify how much of that material is captured on the watch glass. Material unquestionably will become airborne and miss the watch, or when it hits the watch glass, it splatters. That's all part of dispersibility. And if you a little bit better look to the actual equipment, we drop here, define height on the glass in the bottom of a particular container, and Determine how much is captured. So we have our starting weight and then we have our retained weight. The higher the dispersibility, the higher the floodability. 
Now, this caption shows a, a return on it so as to try to keep your environment a little bit cleaner. Uh, however, there have been things that allow it just to fall freely. Right. Converting the index points or the car index points. Each measurements that we just discussed have a maximum point value. Those maximum point values, depend upon whether you're using unity or cohesion, can be anywhere between 100, and then it's either 100 or it's 85. And to demonstrate that is that you have the angle of repose, we have index value of 25, for compressibility, 24, spatula, and then cohesion. Maximum 15, giving total index value of 89 points. To further that, this is the car chart that I'm referencing or discussing and mentioning about. So what we have here for angle of repose, we get the top value here. So an index value of 25. Compressibility was uh, between 9% giving a index value of 24, spatula 25, and we're at the maximum value of the share of less than 6%, 15. So just those measurements, we can candidly refer to the chart here and say that the has a fairly good flowability because we're now at 89. All right. And what's happened here is there are no requirements for breaking. Breaking. All right, let's talk about that for those people who are not familiar with that specific term. However, you likely are all familiar with it. Part of the tendency to cling to themselves. If they cling to themselves to the point where it becomes uh, almost, they basically bridge against themselves. So they'll create a natural bridge which requires an external force to break them apart, whether it's air, whether it's uh, shocking, it's a mechanism that's going to cause that bridge to, to be uh, non-existent and allow water to continue to flow. This test that many clients drive for and they look for because they tell them trying to transport their product from one location to the next location. Well, then they can't get it to where they need it to make the quality of the product that's required. Okay. Flooding, very similar. Flowability point of 89 with the index value. Take together, come up with a total. Now, mind you, this is an example. So don't take this as a for any specific product. And then look at the chart. Our flowability value convert that to an index. We take our angle of fall, our angle of difference and dispersibility, convert that to index values, and reference that on the chart here in this key here, 92. Now we have that because this material has a tendency to be very floodable. I mean, once it starts to flow, it's difficult to control. So we now need. A rotary seal. What's a rotary seal? Quite clearly, some people refer to it as an airlock. Some people refer to it as a pocket rotating valve. So they control the flow of the product. So on from poor flowing product to very quick flowing product, uncontrollable. And we probably experience the fact that when you start to flow a product, the entire silo empties. If the silo empties, well, now you've got nothing but a mess and your product is no longer usable because it becomes contaminated. Now, with reference to all these points and values and indexes, I have to provide you with the one word, caution. That is because in many cases, there is the same index value or car chart or car value for different degrees. So you know that while I have a symbol that gives me 47 degrees 
versus a sample at 54 degrees, but your client uses base. Well, the product's flowing better at 47 than it is at 54. Here's the case. Each one of the rows in the card charts, be it flowability or floodability, all have a range index point. This is what you need to concern yourself with is, is look at the raw data. Look at if you're encountering the fact that you've tested two different products and you see that you have an index value that is the same. Look at data to be able to differentiate between the powders. Sure, it's the same, but they are not. So the PTS, which kind of takes out the uh, the, the technicians. Influence or subjectivity is the fact that no other does are required to determine manually. This is a blue LED light source which is illuminated behind the product. At the time, then a, a uh, coupled camera takes a photo. That photo is then used. Determine the angle. In addition, it is set up such that you can look at either one tilt angle or you the average. In most cases, when you take the average between the two angles, you get a more accurate determination of the angle. So, angle of repose, angle of fall, and angle of spatula are those critical values that need to have so to no subjectivity. Give you an idea of, of what we're talking about. The light, the, and then the key located, unfortunately, outside of the screen here, but it's taking the picture. Once it's taken, we binarize it to so we work for black and white, and we then determine the angles. Then, in the past, uh, when heat or heat of material have been shocked, impact they and what has occurred is that like any held device there's always that opportunity of having in or having after box as I candidly call them. So dropping a weight onto a divine lattice or bar it then for all practical intents and purposes, have aftershock which will affect the heap of material. With the VEX, that is no longer. If there is a defined weight that drops from a defined height, can be and repeatable. This gives you a greater accuracy in the determination of the angle measurements. While as simple as it may be, the angle spatula, what we've developed is, we call it a mold, but it's actually just a guide that identifies the volume of material and the, cons the consistent volume of material that when you look at it, and this is a little bit large here, but this is the angle. Once you've filled the cavity with product, at that point, what you do is the spatula is going to come up, but you have the consistent volume of the product. So you'll have the consistent opportunity for measuring this particular internal friction over again without any subjectivity by here. Um, enhancements is, this is a digitized or um, it's used by a proximity switch that's inside of the instrument that ensures the fact that you will have a one millimeter amplitude vibration. So stack screens or you feeding your aerated cup, you can have consistency in the fact that you're applying the same amount or the same amplitude of vibration on a stack of screens or on the screen that's holding the cavity that holds the product. While it again ensures the 
accuracy and repeatability of analysis. To give you a little bit of an idea of the type of software that's used, um, the software has this form of icons that once you've actually performed the trial or the test, the icons become gray. Now, these have not been performed in this case. Uh, it is not a requirement that you must follow through with all of the measurements in a particular sequence. Is gives the same results. However, if you're going to do angle measurements, and that's probably reasons why I suggested that the, the angle measurements be performed first. It's when you compress the material, you could potentially form operations and would skew these results. So there is a little bit of rhyme and reason as to why you would perform certain measurements and tests first. Okay. All right, the instrument, because there are, are different requirements, each company has a different requirement when it comes time for computerization. It does not have a computer that is supplied with it. A computer has a Windows operating system, you much run software off of any computer. Uh, the sun is capable of being CFR 21 Part 11 for pharmaceutical customers or attendees so that you can have the various registries. Additionally, you have different formats for the pronoun. Typically, comes with a complete powder risk accessor because the PEX is the only instrument that's produced that performs car methods in one assembly. All right. The main unit, the facility, and electronic balance, side sieve screens, complete histograms, and all the necessary parts and tools that would enable a client to take the unit out of the box, position, start your measurements. One of the, as far as the computer the only requirement is that the computer have Win7, third operating system. However, uh, we have units right there operating on Windows 8, 64 bit, so that's not a problem. However, this is just a minimum requirement. This idea here of what the unit looks like laptop, the balance, and angle of repose measurement. All there will be sites that you can visit on YouTube that would enable you then to look at these various methods in action. With our, we have work off of still shots, and from that aspect, this opportunity, and this will be when you come back to the site, our website, you can pick these additional sites up. Yeah, Tim, just to interject there, when we um, set the um, the follow-up email for the webinar today, uh, we include links to the different demonstration videos uh, for PTX. Magnificent. Magnificent. Um, from this aspect, what I want to thank you for attending. Additionally, I want to say that, as I mentioned before, every client, every powder, every blend will have its own unique characteristics. So, just performing and analysis once it may not give you a good representation of let's say power of a period of time. So recommended that once this particular instrument is put into play, either QC or as a developmental tool that and now it's regularly performed use instrument so that you can have a good foundation of your product and an understanding of your product. Now, okay. <laughs> at this point, we'll start our Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions, please continue to submit them using the Q&A panel on screen. Uh, we see we did receive a bunch of questions throughout his presentation. 
Uh, just continue to send them. If him is unable to answer you online, uh, we will contact you as soon as possible offline. All right, first question. Um, sample is required to perform all the methods. Well, quite frankly, because using using 100 ml or 100 cc for the air cities, it suggests that you have a, a minimum of 200 to 500 ml or cc of product. However, remember in the in the presentation, you can obtain alternative vessels. So typically, it's anywhere between to five times the amount of the vessel. Okay. Um, if you use a fresh sample for each method. If you recall, we talked about the various methods when we had the screen. Oops. Um, from that aspect, here I would oh, we go. I just doing the angle of repose, then the test. Provide you that your volume of sample should be sufficient to be able to give you analysis, a quality analysis for each material. Sure. Next question: uh, If mean bulk density is less than 0.4 grams per cubic centimeter, but my particle size is greater than 150 microns, is it possible to perform our uh, cohesion test? Based on values, the, the straight answer to that question is no. You perform the uniformity test. However, what's nice about the PTX, which clients have developed, is hybrid, still proprietary test you could potentially do a cohesion test using different size sieve screens. However, that test will not directly correlate to the car index values. So the question comes, are we looking at the car value for your determination, or are we going to look at the raw data as I recommend? You have the opportunity. So uh, while suggested to use the car methods, methods, you can produce a hybrid or a proprietary test method. Okay. We have seen here uh, about phosphate rock or phosphate fertilizers. Um, that quite some research that we have and be able to provide you with some more specific information, but we've, te we've tested anywhere mineral, food, pharmaceutical, um, chemicals, a wide array of different products. There's probably a good likelihood that we've tested something like that. So there should be not, I, I may have some information, but I want to just arbitrarily say, oh yes, for certain. Um, was asking about the dryness of the powder. He says, are we talking bone dry powder? I guess you're maybe asking what the moisture content. Well, no, if you can identify what the moisture content is of the powder prior to performing any of the analysis, the only requirement would be that the powder is difficult to pass through a screen. I've searched and we've experienced powders that have anywhere up to 3-7% moisture content. They've been able to pass through the screen and we've been able to analyze those powders and, and produce a, a very reliable uh, result. Um, so it really depends, and they, these are some of the features that you can, uh, let's say, well, if, notice the slide that's on the screen at this point, for the input info. You can actually make notations that would become a permanent part or a permanent part of the record for future reference. So I know your product's got 4% moisture, and into the, the file, and it will stay there, and when back to perform similar products, you know then you can come up with similar results. Um, next question. 
happens if your pile is not symmetric and how to determine the angle when the slope is not a nice straight line? Well, fine. Simply because what we're looking at is the the highest point of heat. And if we're working off of the average ridge line, we're looking at both sides of that, that particular heap, and we're taking the average. Taking into consideration the angle of repose or even the angle of spatula, we're looking at the that or the, up, the, the highest point of that heap based on the form that the heap is built upon. So we're looking at the radius, the heap, and then we're taking average because what we're doing is, is these points, what's on the screen right now. So like, an example, while this is symmetrical, unfortunately, um, you're going to take it from the, the top to the edge. Now, in this case here, what, what could occur, and you would see if we had an actual caption of, of a um, binarized heap of material, that the, the dash line goes directly into the product. So we're actually looking at the uppermost point versus the diameter. And relevant if that heap of material is irregular, that should then a problem. Question: What are particle size limits to perform different measurements on a PTX? There is no one. Um, the hardest part that you would have, I mean, let's put the code pretty fine based upon the car. So you're looking at a, a 40 micron, but we've analyzed a well, toner. It's got a top size of 10 micron. It's a very low or mean bulk density, and able to identify how much of that 10 micron powder has been coated on the wire of the weave of the cloth. So uh, there are clients out there that are actually analyzing nanoparticles, the volume, which we can overcome that by means of the different cups. So and one of the things that I did not mention previously is that when you have a limitation of the 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 you can also use a smaller diameter platform for doing the measurements. So there is no, there is, there is really no limit on the lower end. On the upper end, well, quite frankly, the limit is going to be I feed it through my funnel, and my funnel can range up to 10 millimeter. So, you know, and that's the funnel that's listed uh, right here, right here. This is a glass funnel. So the Mac. We actually get much, much larger opening, but the third size opening is 8 and 10. There's two different sizes that are offered with the machine. Uh, what is the time required to do all the tests? Tip speaking depends upon an individual's proficiency with the equipment. can be anywhere between 20 minutes for a rather proficient individual to 45 minutes when you first get started. And, you know, that's Really kind of variable, but typically speaking, if you have all the preliminary information available, you'll be able to run through it in 20 minutes. Uh, how does the overall size of the PTX differ from an older model? It's approximately two thirds the size. It has a much smaller footprint. Oh, sorry, that. smaller footprint, and I'm going to go to the last photo here in the slides. My apologies for that. Oh, okay. This much, much smaller. However, this does not portray the balance or the shooter. But one third the physical size of the former model. Um, weight, you're looking at approximately 70 kg. And what's really nice about this is that this particular polycarbonate cover. Full back over the top, so you have, have complete open access to your work area. Finally, if you were to utilize a vacuum, which of course set elsewhere, you have air that comes in through this rectangular opening and goes out. So there's no disturbance by airflow throughout the process. So hopefully, okay. Uh, um, 
does the unit have the ability to measure particle size and moisture content? Okay, the, the answer to that question is yes, no. no. It have the feature able to determine particle size to identify what the D10 and what the D60 is by either five or seven screens. So vibratory screens, they're stacked, and you can identify the particle size. More content, on the other hand, no, it does not have that ability. So I suggest that, that they be performed online on a more, you know, instrument for that measure. Oh. So the question is, what's the proper technique for cleaning this instrument? Well, quite frankly, what we do here at Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems is, in the dry powder, we'll utilize a vacuum to sure any of the loose powder, but the rest of the equipment can be washed in a water basin. They have stainless steel, um, and it's quite easy. Nothing, nothing that prevents or prevent you from washing, letting it air dry, or even drying it manually by hand. There's, there's no major issue there. Question. It's very light and fluffy, and it is discharged from a dust collector through a rotary air block. I put more material into a 20-gallon container. Is there an indicate how much material I could potentially fill into my 20-gallon collection containers? Uh, back to the air rated density. Let's go back to the pack density, One, otherwise known as the compressibility. If we can apply the values, that will give you a good indication as to how much more material or how much you can actually collect your particular vessel uh, ability percentage. So, so you know, absolutely. Okay. okay. This question is uh, D60 versus D10. For uniformity is based upon what, and what corresponding standard for that criteria? Well, it's difficult to say. Regretfully, I have to admit that I have not had the opportunity to meet or even discuss the car uh, industries with Mr. Carr himself. It would have been uh, rather enjoyable to do, you know, back and forth. However, these standards are. Uh, D50, he said for the D60, and what we're looking at is, again, the particle size uniformity. Uh, the particular formula, unfortunately, I don't have the answer for that, um, but we're taking the two and dividing out and seeing what the percentage of uniformity is, and that, based upon the errors, we can come up with a common, reliable That's nothing to do with that one. Looking here. We're scanning a list of questions and trying to make sure that we're trying to get to all of them. Um, anyone who's asking about an instrument cost, uh, what we can do is we can provide you with a proposal offline and um, We're at a range of approximately of about forty thousand uh, dollars. Does not include the computer. However, that would also include the uh, services of an authorized technician to actually set the unit up, calibrate it, and provide operational training on site. Uh, thing that that would not also include is if, if you're located in California or if you're located outside the U.S., transportation costs, which can be, you know, paired and presented at that particular time. Okay, Tim. Well, thanks so much for uh, the presentation today. Uh, we do see there's a whole bunch of other questions here that are going to require more in, in deep response that Tim will contact you offline. Um, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to continue submitting them, or you can use the contact information on the last uh, page here of the presentation. 
to send him questions directly or, or contact him. Yeah, please, I welcome any questions. Uh, I will try to get back to you as quickly as they come in. Uh, however, it's, you know, depending on the volume, is going to depend on how the queue comes in. Okay. Uh, as mentioned earlier, too, this program was recorded and will be posted to the host Cal website within 24 hours. Um, if you register for this program, you will automatically receive a copy of this presentation's recording and links to all the videos that we described. We pre appreciate your participation today. Thank you so much. Thank you. I look forward to any of those questions that may come in.